Well, hey there. Welcome to the Kim Constable podcast. Nobody cares. Work harder. Got another great interview for you this week. I'm really pumping out the interviews at the minute, aren't I? But it's because so many amazing people are coming to me. And today's guest is absolutely no exception. Her name is the fabulous Tarzan K. Calrissian. Yes, that may sound like a character from Star Wars, and you would be correct, because it is a jungle superhero and a character from Star Wars, because Tarzan actually has a very interesting story around her name, which she is going to share with us in this interview in the podcast, as well as lots of other incredible truth bombs, which I just cannot wait to unleash on you. Tarzan and I met, uh, when did we meet? About three years ago, I think it was. Um, I actually found her through Amy Porterfield, who, if you listen to this podcast, was on a couple of weeks ago. And she used to be a copywriter for Amy. And I reached out to her, knowing that she was Amy's copywriter, and she must be fabulous, and um, asked her to do some copywriting for me. And she came back and told me that, of course, she could, but her day rate was $5,000. And I was like, $5,000 for one day? So immediately what I thought was, well, shit, she must be good. And damn, was I right. She is truly one of the most talented copywriters I have ever met and worked with in my entire life. And not only that, she and I have since become best friends. We actually, a year and a half ago now, before all this coronavirus shit, um, we went to New York and we went to a conference in New York and we spent the four days together um, at the conference, but also, you know, we shared a hotel room. I booked us a suite. We shared a bed. It was her birthday. I brought her coffee and sang happy birthday to her. And it was the most amazing time. We really got to know each other and cement a very strong friendship, which had been built over the internet and through working together. And she truly is one of my favorite people. And I'm so delighted to interview her today on the podcast. You are going to love her, hopefully as much as I do. She is very candid. She is very upfront. She's very similar to me in that she is the breadwinner in her family. She makes more money than her husband. He stays at home with the kids. And she talks about that. She talks about, you know, the struggles and, and the how she's pivoted in her business and changed things. And also she just talks very candidly about her life and how she got to where she is today. And so much more juicy stuff, which I hope you will delight in as much as I did. So before we go to the interview with Tarzan, I would like to tell you, remind you, that you can win a Sculpted Vegan program. And I know many of you are like, I've been trying for months to win one of these damn programs. But, you know, we choose a winner every single month. And if you ain't in it, you can't win it. So leave a review wherever you listen to this podcast. Send me a screenshot of the review. Take a screenshot of it before you post it, because sometimes it can disappear into the abyss and you cannot find it again. Send me that screenshot on Instagram and one of my team will choose a winner from the amazing reviews that are left. And we will announce it at the start of March. This is now February 2021. We are going to announce the podcast winner probably next week, actually, on the podcast or the week after. I'm not sure when we're putting out the episodes, but actually, no, I'll tell you what, we're not going to be announcing it next week because next week's podcast is being recorded later on today. And it is the fabulous J.P. Sears. I don't know whether you guys follow J.P. Sears or not, but oh, if you don't look him up on Instagram at Awaken with J.P., he is a ginger haired comedian who is just quite simply a phenomenal human being. And I really am delighted to um, have secured him as a guest because he just doesn't do interviews to be honest so look out for that next week on the podcast and then the week after is when we will be uh, announcing March's winner or February's winner actually of the Sculpt and Shred big giveaway okay so let's go listen to Tarzan and in all her glory and fabulousness and I will talk to you guys again at the end Tarzan K I cannot believe that we finally made it into a podcast interview well don't forget we had a rehearsal we did. We did have a rehearsal, <laughs> which went diabolically, uh, you know, wrong. And it obviously was not meant to be. So here we are all prepped and ready with questions and microphones. And it all seems to be going well so far. Yeah, this is going to be even better. Here, listen, I have to ask first up, right? Because I know people are going to be going, Tarzan? Like Tarzan? <laughs> like really? Tarzan? So, you know, like, okay, so first up, we just have to get it out of the way. How is it that you came to be named after a jungle superhero? Okay, so you have to know something about my family. I come from a really untraditional family. We were raised in like a very, um, like a really extreme religious sect called the Brethren. And um, we just had so many rules. And we were, we 
my imposed by my dad, who was a missionary for 30 years. And then with our family, he was just like extremely strict. Like we had to wear, my sister and I had to wear dresses all the time. We couldn't watch movies, like any cultural reference prior to like 1998. Like, I just, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know about TV shows. I don't know any of that. I was super sheltered. And because of that, my family just like broke out and went so wild. And uh, my mom was the leader of that. <clears throat> and of so the breakout? Of the breakout. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My parents split up when I was 15 and my mom like started going to see the shaman and she went to, she, huge part of that shift, she started seeing a naturopath totally transformed her like gut bacteria through this diet. Anyway, it changed our lives, this diet. Um, So my mom, so fast forward, like, you know, 20 years, Uh, this is just recently, we're having a family dinner and my mom says, I'm thinking of changing my name. And we're like, oh, okay, this is weird because she already changed her name. Uh, Her name's Passiona. And uh, she said, you know, I've been Passiona for 10 years now. And I'm coming up on my 70th birthday and, you know, like I might be ready for something new. And we're like, oh yeah. Okay, great. Like, we'll support you in that. Like, what, what are you (laughs) like, do you have a name in mind? And she's like, yeah, I, you know, I thought of something, but like, it's really weird. And I'm like, okay, well, can't be more weird than Tarzan. And she's like, well, you know, it's a man's name. And I'm like, okay, yeah, uh, hello, Tarzan. And uh, she says, (laughs) I'm thinking of changing my name to Thor. Thor? (laughs) Thor. Yes, Thor. (laughs) Thor. So now we call her Thor. Did she change her name to Thor? Well, so this is the thing. Most people in her circle know her as Passiona. Um, Like she was born Linda And then she became Pashina and like her inner circle, we all know her as Linda. Her friends know her as Linda. She kept her name for her work. She's a financial planner. Um, So, you know, her only her special clients call her Pashina, but you know, she's been Pashina. Like I call her Pashina. I don't even call her mom, call her Pash. So with this new Thor thing, this is like inner, inner circle. You know, so I can now call her Thor. Anyway, I want to give some background because in my family, like this is something we're allowed to do. I also have some friends who changed their last name to Awesome. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I was like, oh, well, I could do anything with my name. I have have some friends who changed their name to Full of Love. Full of Love. Oh, that's so good. Yeah, Yeah. I love that. Full of Love. I love that. So I changed my name um, when I started a business. Like my my previous name was like sort of taken on Google. And so, I, but also I just felt like I'd outgrown it. And when this name Tarzan came to me, I was like, this is weird, but this is my name now. And I had to grow into it. Like I had to learn what age how to. Were you? What age? I was. Um, I'm going to say about 29 or 30. Yes. I mean, just to be clear, you changed your name. Your name was Amy beforehand, wasn't it? My name was Amy beforehand and I changed my name like legally. It's now on my birth certificate. I'm Tarzan K. Calrissian. Wow. Yeah. Um, and you changed your surname too. Yeah. When I, so my husband and I, when we um, had a child, we both come from really matriarchal families. So to pass on either of our last names was like, I don't know. It just didn't feel like, like, why would we do that? And whose name would we choose? And why not just make up another name? So we took um, Calrissian from Star Wars. I just love it. I was telling my friend the other day and she just thought it was the best story ever. <laughs> and of course, whenever I first met you, I didn't, because your your sister Zion, she also changed her name to yes. Zion Calrissian. So because you yes. all had the same surname, I just assumed your parents were hippies. I was like, yeah, her parents must have been hippies. I used to tell people that. <laughs> I used to totally make shit up about you. I'd be like, yeah, her parents are hippies. Like she's Tarzan, <laughs> Zion. That was the only plausible explanation. Of course, I never thought to actually ask and get the data. <laughs> so far, so far uh, away from what I actually thought it was. Um, but talking about your husband, actually, is it? It is true that you're the main breadwinner in the house, isn't that right? 
Yeah, that's right. I when when our son was one year old, we decided that he would stay home and I would start this business. And I was like 100% unproven. Like I didn't even know. I hadn't even been able to really ever take care of myself. Like, or I could, but at the bare minimum, like I had figured out how to have a really great life with very little money. Like I could get by on like five or $10,000 a year. I don't even know how I did it, No, but I did it. You know, you couch surf, you travel, whatever. Uh, So, uh, but somehow he thought I could do it and he really wanted to stay at home with our son. And so I was like, okay, I guess I'm starting this business now. And I got so official, like I rented an office and I would go there every day, like at nine o'clock and I'd come home at five o'clock and, um, yeah. And I, and then I never stopped even when, when, um, so about two years in, I was doing really well and I was like supporting the family. We had more money than we'd ever had. We were so excited. We were dealing with like so much of our like emotional chow chow around money. Cause it's weird. It's like, you know, you got to deal with stuff when you go from not having money to having money. So, uh, you know, that was Rocky, but then I got pregnant and this was not a plan. This was not in our plan. We were just going to be a one child family. Um, so I got pregnant and my, I had this intense fear. I was like, Oh my God, Jay is going to want me to be a stay at home mom now. And I'm really like, I don't feel like I'm cut out for that. And at the same time, he's thinking to himself, I have to go get a job. I'm going to have to start working again. So there was a very rocky period there that didn't last very long because finally we came together and we're like, oh yeah, you want to keep doing what you're doing. I want to keep doing what I'm doing. Let's just figure this out. So we did. But um, there is a lot of figuring out, as you know, Kim, when you make you know more than your husband. In my case, he doesn't produce any income. He's home with the kids, which I'm so grateful. I don't want him to go get a job. Um, of course if he did, I'd support him, but oh my God, it is very messy. It's yes. very messy. And you know, there's a lot of, it of is, it's time. messy and it's, um, and it requires a lot of growth and a lot mm-hmm. of learning and, um, a, a lot of soul searching. It, it requires a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of growth. I mean, certainly that's what happened in our yeah. house as well. And I know that's something that you and I definitely have in common, um, that we've talked about before is the fact that we earn more money than our husbands. Um, mm-hmm. and we are the bread, but we also have children and like the whole dynamic mm. that comes with that. But I love that the narrative is, is shifting on that or seems to be shifting for women anyway. But what I want to ask is like, you've talked about your business, like what you are, okay. So actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna just I'm gonna have it written down here. I so I always used to call you because how we met was you. I find you through Amy Porterfield, who I interviewed the other week on the podcast. It was amazing. Um, she said, "Fuck." I loved her for that. <laughs> oh my I got, god! I got her to swear. Wow. <laughs> I know. I just think people can't help it around me, though. <laughs> I think it's the Irish charm that I bring out. Definitely. Um, And so anyway, I met you through Amy and um, hired you to do some copywriting for me. And I then I then I branded you as the world's most expensive copywriter because I had never met anyone who was charging at which you were at the time. Now, now, if you want to book you for a day, it's like I don't do it anymore. Don't do. Oh, you don't do do it at all anymore. I thought maybe you still did a day's consulting. Um, But at the time, you were five thousand dollars a day, and I was like. $5,000 $5,000 a day? A day? Like, what does a day get me? <laughs> how many words? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, so tell me about your business and how you started and what it is that you're doing now. Okay. So I started out um, as a copywriter. And I started out as a copywriter and I very quickly was became interested in this world of online courses. And I thought it would be really interesting to write emails and sales pages. So like within my first year, I just decided that was going to be my specialty. And I found these people doing this through courses. Um, So my business, like, I guess I probably had a bit of a knack for marketing. You know, the thing is, is like, I have a, I have a, like, hmm, how do I say this? (laughs) I have a strong personality. Like I, and I'm Tarzan. So when you meet Tarzan, like you don't quickly forget. So I had that on my side right at the beginning. And I almost always had demand. Like, it's not like there was ever, um, you know, periods that were scary and I didn't know where my next client was coming from. But in general, I was pretty steady. Like I got clients by hanging out in Facebook groups 
uh, for the programs that I had bought. And so I was connecting constantly with course creators and the work just seemed to flow. Mm -hmm. And there was almost always more demand than I can handle, especially because I have, I'm the opposite of you. I have like extreme boundaries around my working hours, partly because partly for my husband's sake, like he does really want me to be present and at home and with the children. And I want to be with them too. Like I have kids, my kids right now are two and six. Like Mm. they're just like so precious. They're so sweet. Like I just want to like watch them all the time. So even back then I was working four days a week and I was like nine to five. And so I could only do so much. So I just kept raising my rates and I just kept raising my rates and people kept saying yes. And, you know, you, so it started and I always did day rate work just for me. That was like, helped me contain the client so that Mm -hmm. I didn't have to me having all these overlapping projects that are ongoing, like that just felt like stressful. So I would do day rate. I started at a thousand dollars a day And once that got going, I raised it to 1500 and then 2,500. And then I sort of just kept going. Now I will say, Kim, I feel like copywriters, I don't know, maybe this was me back then too, but I see what copywriters are charging when they're not even that experienced with Mm -hmm. like three, four years of experience, like charging $5,000 a day. I'm like, whoa, that is really brave. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I, I just kept raising the price to match the demand. And eventually I was like, you know, I had great credibility because I do a lot of podcast interviews. Like I'm good at marketing myself. I have an email list. I'm great at email. It's my superpower. So I just, the demand kept growing. But I also found that as my sort of like copywriter celebrity grew, people were coming to me who I felt like you really shouldn't be spending $5,000 for me to write a sales page. Like you were at a unique stage of business. You were like, I'm growing this thing fast. You were, you had, Mm -hmm. you know, you had your design, you had your tech, like you had your shit dialed in. Mm -hmm. You were at a stage where, I was like, yes, I see the ROI clearly. Like, this is a great investment for you. But I got to a point where the clients who were coming to me, I was like, you know, you might not get the ROI on this. Like, if you, I'm going to write this great sales page for you or like a really awesome stack of emails, but then you're, you don't have an audience. So the emails can't sell for you if there's nobody reading them. And for a sales page, like, if you, if you try and design it yourself, like it's not gonna, like, it's going to be wonky. It's like, you know, so the, the price that like the price of my time no longer matched, like it just, the offer wasn't a good match. So at that point I started transitioning from working with clients to selling courses, which is what I do now. And that transition took like a good two years. And I haven't, I, you know, I, I have, the last time I had a client was like, last summer. Mm-hmm. And I had maybe three clients last year, but now, uh, you know, I said like, oh, I don't do that anymore. I'm like, I guess I don't, I don't know. Occasionally. Well, here's the thing. You're flexible yeah. and you're open to, yeah. you know, if the right offer came along and if it was something that you want to do. I like to think that if I ever came to you and said, <laughs> you would say, yes, my darling. <laughs> and then hit me with a massive price tag because you know how much money we make. <laughs> it would be hard for me to say no. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what it is, though, I think. And I see this in um, I see this a lot of my million dollar mentor group. So we we launched a business program, as you know, last year, intending to launch a proper super business program this year, which mm-hmm. I decided I'm not going to do. I'm just going to stick with the Sculpted Vegan, which I think was a really good decision. Um, but I think that what I what I see a lot in the group is people um, I I can hear what you're saying because somebody may come to you and go, oh my God, she's $5,000, right? She's Jesus Christ reincarnated in a person typing emails or writing a sales page. So this sales page, if I spend five grand on this sales page, I'm going to make $100,000. They think that if they're Mm -hmm. investing this amount of money, which is, you know, a large amount of money, but they're investing Mm -hmm. this in the sales page, that they're going to make so much money and they put all of their eggs in that basket and then they blame you when they don't make the money. Yeah, okay. 
It's partly a problem of the industry though, because the industry is like incredibly hypey and everywhere you look, it's like make six figures, make seven figures. Like I'm going to give you the shortcuts. I'm going to tell you the secret. Like there's so much messaging where people think that if they just make the right investment, Mm -hmm. that everything will fall into place. Like I still fall into this. I'm still like, who could I hire that would like give me the secret that would like take my business like to multiple seven figures? That's like the next goal. Um, and I still think that, and of course yeah. I hire people and I learn, I'm constantly learning, but this idea that there could be one thing, like it's not true. No. And what most of us have to learn the hard way is like, it's just fucking work. Yeah. Like it's carrying water, chopping wood. Like if those who are successful at it, they just do not give up. Like they will have a, like, we've all had launches that flopped. Like I've had so many flops. I've had so many, like, even now what, as like a, I'm a really good marketer and I've still done stuff. That's like, Whoa, this like, didn't eat, well, I didn't even make 25% of my sales goal here. Like what the shit happened? Yeah. Uh, that's like, that is how you learn. So I, that's another reason why I just axed that offer. Cause I was like, I don't want people coming to me thinking that if you give me $5,000, suddenly everything will work for you and you'll be like rolling in money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they have it. I think that people just, people used to say to me in the million dollar mentor, my, my people Kim, if you could just give us your entire system, if you could just explain exactly how, you know, exactly how to do the emails, exactly how to do the onboarding emails, the post sales emails, how to set up the webinar, Mm -hmm. then I'll have your success. And I used to go, no, no, you won't, because it doesn't matter what system you have. Like you, Mm -hmm. I could give you a gym plan and I could say, here's the gym plan. Oh, and it's not like all you need to do is show up to the gym and do the, and the, the amount of sets and the amount of reps. If you did the amount of sets and the amount of reps for a short period of time, yes, you may make some progress in your body, but actually to completely change your body, you need to understand nutrition. You need to understand pushing to failure. You need to understand increasing load. You need to understand good form. The plan is just like the shell. It's what you put into it underneath that actually makes you successful. But if you could go back and, you know, to kind of the start of your career for, you know, and and give, because I really want to plug into like the whole, Mm. you know, what it is that you're doing now and how you've transitioned into the online world. Because we do have a lot of people who follow me for business. And so I know they'll be interested in this because copywriting mm-hmm. is something um, that, you know, that is that is interesting to people. I think sales, Tarzan, is, is, you know, you're saying there wasn't a lot of copywriters in the beginning. So just to segue a little bit, first of all, I think that so many people are scared to sell. They're scared to put themselves out there. They're scared mm-hmm. to sell. They're scared to learn to sell. And I always remember Robert Kawasaki uh, watching an interview with him once and he had said to this girl, who come to him and she uh, she said I've just written a book and it's an amazing book and it's getting really good reviews you know how would you you know recommend that I you know have more people read my book and he said well I would say you know in enroll in a sales program or enroll in a sales course and your local college or online and you know and 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 do that first and she said but I'm not a salesperson I'm a writer and he said and he was actually, I think, promoting his book at the time. He was signing copies. And he said, well, do you see on the on the front page, of, on the front cover of my book over there, do you see what it says? And she looked over and she said, you know what? And he said, it says Robert Kawasaki, best selling author. It doesn't say best writing author. He said, you can write all you want, but if you can learn to sell, you ain't going to sell shit. You're not going to be successful. And I think that is probably the thing that is missing for many people. It's that confidence to to sell to to put into words your thoughts and your feelings and your actions which is what you do so well for people so if you're not willing to learn to do it yourself and it's not that I'm I I can copyright reasonably well I can you know mm. but I'm it's a skill that I had I focused on and honed it I believe I probably could have done quite well at it but it's not it like it is a it is a skill so to go back to my original question if you could what <laughs> If you could go back to the start of your career and wish that you had have known like one thing when you began it, what would that thing be? What would you advise young Tarzan at the start of her career? So I, okay. I wish that I had known, and I still have to learn this lesson. I remind myself this all the time. I wish that I had known that I was going to learn, like my, I would learn through adversity. So all the things that I failed at, like, those are the stories that I tell over and over. And those are where, that's where I got the best lessons. So that's one thing that's really important. But also a lot of, you know, this, a lot of people don't know 
that when you are starting a business, like you are signing up for a serious journey in personal development. Mm -hmm. Like it is intense. Like that fear of selling, that is fear of rejection. And that runs so deep, so, so deep. Like we all have trauma. We all have trauma. We say, even if you had a great childhood and it's not obvious, we all have trauma. And our trauma shows up in like how we are in the world. Like that's where, you know, we're just playing out these patterns and we're just sort of constructing our model of the world based on what we experienced when we were like six years old. So it's not just about learning to sell. It's like, well, also you have to learn how to sell and it is very teachable. Like I've taken lots of copywriting courses. You can learn this skill. And I do recommend you learn this skill before you outsource it. If you just outsource to a copywriter, like you're going to end up being like, mm, doesn't sound like me. Well, that's because you don't know what you sound like. So you have to figure this out. And also this skill is just like, we all need this skill. Every business owner needs to have this skill, whether or not you pay someone like you, Kim, you can hire a copywriter, but then you can also talk to that copywriter and say, Hey, like I, you know, I think you missed the mark on this email. Like you have, you must have that skill. So the, the dream is like, I could just pay someone to sell for me and then I don't have to do it but you're still operating based on all your programming. So there's like, there's, there's two points here, which is like, A, you have to do your own personal healing because it will show up in your business all the time in all the different places. And B, you also actually have to learn how to do this. And there's many great courses. Like there's lots of training available. Part of it is just practice. Like actually great writers. I don't think great writers are born. I think it is possible to be born with some natural talent, but mostly like it's practice. I'm mm -hmm. so good at email because I have written thousands of emails. Therefore, I can do it really well, but it's mostly practice. Yeah, which is which I absolutely love because it's something that I I teach and I preach on this podcast all the time like consistency and practice and discipline and mm -hmm. showing up every day and and uh, but I love what you said about the failure because um well, of course one of my mottos is the gym is one of the only places you need to fail to succeed. Like you have to fail in the gym otherwise you're mm -hmm. not going to grow muscles. But you know, it's true whenever I'm um you know whenever I'm writing stories or now what I do is make Loom videos for Alison who copyrights for us. And, you know, I, it's all my failures. It's all the times when I didn't get shredded, when I didn't follow the plan, when mm -hmm. I, you know, when I, when I failed, those are the, those are the things that people relate to. People don't relate to, they do relate to the successes, but they want to hear you're like me. I'm like you, you've mm -hmm. struggled where I'm now struggling and you've overcome that struggle. Mm -hmm. And, and now you have success. So you get me. That's what someone needs to mm -hmm. hear whenever they're, they're thinking about buying your stuff. It's now kind of, you get me, but now you mm -hmm. don't actually do copywriting for people. You teach copywriting. Isn't that right? So mm -hmm. you have your own line, you're, you've promoted for other people as well, but now you've really transitioned into making, you know, into your own products. Tell us more about that. Okay. So I transitioned from being a service provider to being a course creator, primarily through selling other people's programs. Like while I was developing my own programs, I also would be an affiliate for other people's programs. And the reason that worked is because I promote with a lot of integrity. Like I only promoted programs that I had purchased myself, like of my own volition and, and had great success with. And then uh, it was like, why wouldn't I promote this thing? Mm -hmm. Typically in the industry of online courses, um, 50% commissions, very standard. And I had a well-nurtured, like well-loved on email list that was really wanting to know like, well, what did you do to get where you are? I took this program. So I started doing affiliate promotions. And in the meantime was like quietly working on my first major program called email stars. I have several like workshops and, you know, I had many practice runs with things that are no longer available. But um, I was quietly working on this program, Email Stars. And then last year, I had this major light bulb where I was like, oh my God, the amount of energy and time that I have put into promoting other people's programs makes no sense. Mm -hmm. Like it made sense at the time when I was like, okay, 
I'm a service provider. I could sell these courses. It's completely passive. I don't have to deliver on it. Like I am a believer in affiliate promotions. It worked well. It worked. And then it got to a point where I was like, this is actually really messed up. Like I'm prioritizing selling other people's stuff when I have my own program, email stars, which is really good and really profitable. Um, so last year I decided to just drop it all, all of my affiliate promotions, drop them all. Um, I'll still like send out an affiliate link here and there. If it's like, you know, we, sometimes things come up and I'm like, I'm not against, it's not like a hard and fast rule, mm-hmm. but an affiliate promotion, like I treat those promotions like it's my own. Like I have my own sales page. I write all the sales emails. Like I do all the things. And I started to see like, wow, that's an enormous amount of energy to put into someone else's business. And I looked at my, I looked at my, like, you know, when you open Instagram and you, you go to the IGTV view Mm -hmm. and I looked at it and I was like, okay, I see like, 10 pictures of Amy Porterfield. I was promoting her program at the time. I was like, this is totally fucked up. This makes no sense. Like, how did I, how did I think this was okay? Right. So it was okay until it was not okay. So Mm -hmm. now, you know, I like, now I'm in a year of not, I'm in like, this is a really different year for me. Like that's about half a million dollars in revenue that I just decided I would no longer, um, no longer have coming in. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I still have email stars. And right now, as we're speaking, I'm recording a copywriting course. And this is what my people have asked me for, like since my first year in business. And I always was like, I don't, I don't think I want to, other people are doing it better. I don't think that's for me still consistent people asking, like, are you going to do this? No, 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 no. And then the funny thing is like, last year I was like, okay. So it was like September. I realized I'm not doing any more affiliate promotion. So I need to make a new program. And I spent so much time like, what will this program be? What would I teach about? Like, hmm, I really don't know. Should I teach about launching? Like, anyway, when it dawned on me, like, obviously it's a copywriting course. Right. Duh. <laughs> anyway, now here we are. So that's launching. And how hard has it been this year? I'm asking because as you're talking, I've gone through a similar, um, I've gone through a similar process, I guess, in that last year in the business, you know, with whenever coronavirus hit, everybody knows the story who listened to this podcast. You know, I had a hundred thousand pounds on Facebook ads for, you know, one of our biggest launches of the year. And I really kind of had, I, I had focused on growing the business, but I hadn't gone hardcore at growing the business. It had grown really well. Like we were at like three million, two, two point five million dollars in revenue or whatever. So it was, and it was good and it was growing, but there's something that happens whenever someone likes to fire up your ass, like a little bit of fear, like to motivate you. And, um, and I, last year, of course, once coronavirus hit, then we did the jailhouse shred and then we created butt camp and then we did, you know, the meal planning masterclass and then we did basement jacked and then we did butt camp again. And then we did, you know, we like, we, you know, we went from, you know, 2.2 million dollars turnover, I think it was, or two and a half million dollars to, um, just over 4 million this year. So we literally doubled our turnover. And, but then now this year I was like, I, my team and I looked at each other and we were like, we can't do that again this year. We just can't. Mm-hmm. It, it was exhausting, but also it was dependent on launch after launch, after launch, after launch. Mm-hmm. So this year we had to take a step back and say, we had to take a lot of, um, a lot of risks, I guess, and say, right, well, we, you know, so this year we have so many different things that we're launching, you know, like pr- programs, but also a one-to-one coaching program, which launched on Monday and, mm-hmm. you know, we're doing, um, apparel and we're launching, um, a new app, which is costing like about probably the guts of $200,000. Uh, I know it's where the first phase is about a hundred thousand and then the next two phases will be about 50,000 each. And so that that's all happening this year. So I know my turnover probably isn't going to be as high as it was last year, although it may, it may be, I'm not sure, but also we focused on our funnels, but it's been a very kind of like, now I'm finding myself like, Oh, and you know, sometimes you go, Holy fuck, holy fuck, am I doing the right thing? You know, because my family are responsible for, you know, like, and I take care of so many family members financially as well. It's not just my family. I take care of my extended family financially. And suddenly you go, it's an, it's an immense amount of pressure, isn't it? Sometimes when you're just like, holy shit, I have so many people, not only just my employees, because we have 21 full-time employees now in the company, 
as well as all the part-time people, as well as the contractors, as well as my extended family. And sometimes I just go, why did I even sign up to this? <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I just want to go back to being a yoga teacher. I don't really, but sometimes I feel like I do. Do you feel like that as well sometimes? Or is this year being hard for you in terms I, of moving sideways? I just have to say before we get into this, one of the things I admire the most about you, Kim, is your bravery. Mm-hmm. And I like that episode, I hope everyone listens to it. Make sure you put it in the show notes where you walked us through your year last year, I just like, my heart was like seizing, like, oh my God, not just working so hard because putting in the hours, like I'm amazed that you're physically capable of doing that. Um, but you know, taking on that level of stress, like of, so I'll tell you something while you were making your bold moves, launching your program, I was like hoarding money. And I still do this. Like, it's actually something that I have to work on. But, you know, I do feel like I'm probably capable of dealing with stress if I wanted to. However, like, perhaps it's like like my whole lifetime of financial stress. Like, I never was financially secure ever. My family was not financially secure. Like, I am just, as some alarm bells are going off right now. I'm like, ding, ding, ding. I have to deal I with this. I love it. <laughs> so um, now in my, you know, now I'm 36 and I feel like I'm probably financially secure. Like, you know, I'm working, like I also didn't start saving for retirement or doing any sort of investing or like owning anything until recently. So I just like have a huge, like a huge ass safety net. (laughs) It's a bit ridiculous. Wow. Um, So I started out, like I started out 2020 with like $350,000 in the bank and my business is operating expenses at the time we weren't doing a lot of ads. So let's say it was like $30,000. So I basically was like, I have a year in the bank and even now, I, I, I'm I not saying this like it's good advice. So listeners, be aware. Um, but I do think, like for me, I need a safety net. Like that financial security, like it really, like it saved me so much last year. Like we had several promotions that did not do what we wanted them to do in 2020. Um, we had like a launch that we postponed. Um, we just, nothing happened the way we thought it would in 2020. And the whole year long, I was like, so grateful for this safety net that I had built. And yes, it was larger than it needed to be like, but whatever it was there. And I was grateful for it. So as I was listening to you talk about like, you're like, some people just function great that way. You're like, my toes are to the fire. Like I, and I'm not, I will not fire one single person. Like I'm just going to figure this shit out and, Mm -hmm. and go, and I'm willing to go through like a dark night of the soul. Um, and I just, I listened to that episode and I was so amazed. Um, so it's not to say we didn't have challenges last year. Like I did really like go through a major existential awakening last year. I started working with psychedelic mushrooms and in like, in those journeys that I did, I just was like, I, I just woke up. I woke up and I, I suddenly became aware of so many things that I had never been aware of before. And the thing about, um, the thing about working with psychedelic mushrooms as, or any psychedelics is like, it opens you up in all directions. So it's like, yes, now, um, now I can like perceive this beauty and these, like this beauty and possibility and all these all this amazing stuff. And also I now can perceive like stuff that is horrifying and I really don't even want to look at. So I went through this last year. So more than like, I didn't actually create that much change in my business. We basically just did the launches that we had planned to do, but all the time I was like figuring out what is my message here? What is my responsibility to this audience that I am leading and I am training them with my programs? Um, so that was last year, 2020, and it was like very like emotionally demanding and like a lot of painful growth. Uh, like I spent a lot of time last year like laying under my desk. Wow. Oh my gosh. Do you know what though? I love that because I think that, you know, 
I'm in the position now where obviously the business makes a lot of money and we have a lot of, you know, and, and I have, a, we have a lot of money in the bank. Um, I don't even know how much now, cause I have a financial controller who does all my worrying for me, a oh full-time financial controller in the company. Brilliant. And she literally does all my worry. I don't even check my bank account anymore. It's amazing. Oh, so, um, beautiful. but I guess then what happens is I go, okay, the business is doing really well. I have, you know, I have all this cash sitting in the bank and then I go, okay, how can I use this to grow? And it's almost like I'm, I, I, I have this compulsion to put myself back into risk again. It's like I, I, I could hold on to it and I could be careful or whatever, but I'm like, you know, it's funny. Alison said to me, Alison, um, who you sent, Alison Gower, my copywriter, who you sent to me, actually, he was a student of yours. Um, we've worked together now for nearly three years or two years, two years, three years, I'm not sure. She said to me recently, she said, Kim, what I love about you, or I was talking about, you know, a, a spectacular failure that I had had in the business. It wasn't a failure, but it wasn't, it was a failure, but it wasn't just quite, didn't go the way we expected it to go. And I made, a, I learned so much about, about, you know, what not to do from it. And I said to her, oh my God, like I learned what, what to do and what not to do from this. And she said, the reason why your learning is so huge is because you risk big. She said, mm. you take big risks. And so therefore mm. you, the learning you get from those risks is enormous. Mm. You learn more from your massive risk taking than most people learn like in a year because you're willing to take that risk. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, it's actually true. And you know what? I've never put myself or my family in a, in a financially precarious position where we couldn't mm -hmm. pay the bills. Um, although my husband, he still learns an income as well. So, you know, if, if it all went tits up, it, we will be fine. And we have a good savings account. So um, I would never put my family in precarious positions, but it seems like now I've got to this year and I'm like, okay, now I need to invest all this money that I've made and I need to, to use it to grow, you know, and I know that this year we're going to invest to grow, but I think that there's a good balance of, you know, there's a part of me would love to be more like you and be a bit more conservative. My husband's the saver and I'm the spender, you know, in our relationship. And, but there is a part of me that is like, wouldn't it be lovely to have that nice big nest egg and have no compulsion to, to <laughs> risk. But then I don't really feel like I would be living if I didn't, you know, for me, it's about the, the living, you know, but here, I want to ask you though, about, about the, uh, psychedelic mushrooms and about LSD. Cause you're in Canada mm -hmm. and LSD is legal in Canada. And full uh, disclaimer, no, it's no? not legal, but it's a schedule three. So schedule three is like, um, that's where marijuana used to be before it was legal. And there is like some, the, the, it looks like we're moving in that direction, but by comparison, like in the United States, most of psychedelics are schedule one, like on par with heroin or cocaine. So in Canada, it's like much, you know, it's like much you, softer. It's available. Softer like nobody's drug, yeah. going to jail. Um, yeah. I used know, to take a lot of LSD when I was younger. You know, I used to, I took oh. a lot of drugs. I took it all. I took ecstasy, cocaine, LSD. I drank alcohol. I smoked <laughs> marijuana. I, I, I was just I, just, I always experimented. And so um, I remember I used to love it. I haven't taken it in years and years, like since I was like 20 or something, I think. But tell me about that. How did you get into that? Or how did, you know, and what have been the benefits? And Okay. So I also, I also did all sorts of drugs and uh, quite serious ones in my teenage years. And then, but in my family, there's um, like a lot of drug, drug addiction, serious drug addiction. And I was like, um, you know, in ab ab about to be 20, let's say. And I was like, you know what? I, this is just not the path for me. Like, mm -hmm. I, I don't, I don't want to go down this road. I don't like it. And so I, and now in my life, I'm like almost a teetotaler. Like I can have one, you know, I've, I've been drinking. I was like, come on, drink up girl. Hurry up. Drink, yeah. I have like two margaritas and I'm like, I'm drunk. Like, I gotta go lay down. Like, <laughs> I am really not a substance user and I'm definitely not a substance abuser. However, uh, my coach who I'd been working with for 10 years, started to do, um, to started to lead journeys and do like integration work. <clears throat> for people who are doing psychedelic journeys. And I was like, great, I will be uh, like, sign me up for that. Yeah. And I think I actually was possibly the first like guided trip that she led. And um, so I was, it was like, to it was so different from like, let's get high. And like, I'm talking to the grass. Like, this was very different. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, in a, in um, a space that is like prepared and for this purpose 
And we started off figuring like, okay, what do you want from this journey? What, like, what are you hoping to gain? Like, how do you want to grow? And I went into that and I I really wanted to find my purpose because also last year I had this existential crisis. I was like, I'm making all this money and I don't really know what it's for. Like, I just feel like I'm trying to have more, 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 and I don't know why. And I'm finding it really unfulfilling, which let me just pause and open a parenthesis here. I feel like as I talk to my people about this, when I say that, it kind of sounds like judgment for people who want to make lots of money or judgment about wanting to make money. Not that is me. not what no. this is. Like no. I, you know, I just adore the way you go after wealth. And I, I think it's so beautiful. Mm. This is purely for myself. I was like, I don't know what this means. I don't know what this number is in my bank account. Like, I don't even, you know, I'm running myself ragged doing all these promotions and this doesn't even make sense. So I went into this journey and I wanted to find my purpose. I wanted to figure out what this was all about. And um, so it was like, a, you know, this particular first journey that I did, it's like lasts about five hours, like a five hour trip. And it's guided and it's guided in that, like the, my coach, like she's there with me. She's making notes. If I need to talk through stuff, if I'm scared, like it was so intense it's after that, it's after like- that day, I got home and I told my husband, I was like, that was equivalent to giving birth. Kim, you have given birth four times, you know, like giving birth is. Well, you probably did. You gave birth to a new part yeah, of yourself. Totally. Yeah, I did. And uh, I got so much from that journey. uh, And I spent the year unraveling it. And I did, you know, I did other, like, you know, trips here and there throughout the year. And every time I go in, like, I learn something that feels so fundamental and important. There's just so many answers in there. And it's really like, uh, really actually helped me connect so deeply to m- why I'm doing my work, what parts of my work I actually need to do, what I don't need to do. Like that decision to stop doing affiliate promotions, the decision to create this copywriting course, even the decision of what to name the course, like that all came from my work with psychedelics. I so that. I'm a huge, like huge um fan or proponent yeah yeah Yeah. huge proponent I get it well because uh, you know for me the reason you know I have always been very very value-led and there's a lot of you know values are either toward or away from values so we either go toward something or we move away from something away from fear um my values have always been very much a toward value you know I was always very very clear which I never even considered that everybody wouldn't be but actually now that I'm talking to you I have another friend who um in the last three or four years made like more than a hundred million dollars who really just is like, I, I feel apathetic about my life. I don't know where I am. I don't know what I'm, you know, what I'm, I don't know what it's all for. Whereas I'm like, I'm I'm really clear. I'm like, I know exactly where I'm going and what it's for and what, you know, so I never considered that I, that was fortunate for me to, to be that way. Like my husband said to me this morning, do you realize that in the last year we've spent a hundred thousand dollars on cars for other people? For other people. <laughs> for other people, Tarzan. A hundred thousand wow. dollars on buying cars for other people in wow. my family. And wow. I was like, really? And he was like, yeah. And I was like, we bought my housekeeper a car. I bought my sister a car. We bought his dad a car. We bought um, somebody else a car. I can't even freaking remember now. <laughs> but yeah. we just, you know, and that that's me. I'm like, if somebody needs help, I want to be able to help them. I want to be able to, you know, I, like I said, I, I take care of my family financially when they need it. If they need it, if my nieces and nephews need things, I pay for it. If my mom needs something, you know, I, I pay for it. If, you know, my dad needs something, I pay for it. And that's so clear to me that that is my value. My value is taking care of others. And I, yeah, I never even thought that. Yeah. that okay. Stuff. So this is interesting because I know this isn't new for you. Cause I've also heard you say with your family that you live by principles and not by rules. Mm-hmm. So actually trying to figure out what are your principles that is like, it doesn't happen overnight. And even me saying like, I asked, what is my purpose? And then I got the answer. Like, actually, uh, I went way back to the moment of conception. Like I was born into this like very, very 
uh, intensely Christian family. Like there was a reason for that. Like I was born, my dad was like all my life long. He or all of my life that he was living. He wanted us to be focused on what is important. He had this thing about us being worldly. That's why we couldn't watch TV and we couldn't like, um, we couldn't just wear pants like boys did. Um, but he, I see it now. I'm like, okay, I came into this life because like, I, this is what it's about is like figuring out what are my values? What are my principles? Like, what is my purpose here? All of that is connected. I am fortunate that I got a real serious education in that from the day I was born. Not everybody does. Um, but I just want to point that out because I know you've done some, you know, you've done a lot of work on this yourself. Yeah. 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 I have for, for many, many years actually, but it never even, it's not often I learn something new about myself in a podcast actually. So that was, that was good. Do you say this? I wish you and I should have more conversations. One thing I want to touch on, um, I can't believe we've been talking for ne nearly an hour, but I, I think that this is something that you and I haven't spoken about much at length because we do know each other very well. Mm -hmm. Um, but I am curious to know more about is this year you, you really, seemed to, after the Black Lives Matter um, movement, mm -hmm. you really seemed to take on like a, a campaign, especially on your Instagram for kind of for social change. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask you more about that and, and not where did that come from? Because people might go, oh, well, why, why, what do you mean, where did that come from? But, you, you know, each of us has our own oh. reasons for, you know, for that things are important for us it, and for campaigning. Yes. And I would love to know if you'd be willing to talk about it, you know, yeah. what that was and where that came it, from. It, and so for me, it actually came from a very specific place. So I, this is in 2019, I hosted an event and knowing, having had that experience, I'm like, fuck, I was really not ready to do that. Hosting an event with a hundred guests who you feed lunch and have speakers and tell them where to go and how to get the, you know, it was like, oh my God, was I not ready in so many ways. Um, <laughs> So anyway, we hosted this event and after the event, it was like a little shaky. I was like, sort of like, you know, when you worked out really hard and you're like, whoa, like, am I okay? Like my muscles are twitching. That's what I was like at the end of the event and whatever it ended. And, um, I, we pulled it off and we had sold a mastermind experience at that, um, at that event. It was an eight month program. And I got an email from this woman and, um, she's a Muslim woman. She's a Brown woman. And she said, Hey, you have a serious problem lady. Uh, you, so at this event, we had like our, our staff, like all white staff, all white speakers, everyone. It was just like a really white centric thing event that we put on like from through that lens only through that one lens and then and I cringe when I think about this and then we ended the event with like this big um donation event where we were like raising money for poor children in Africa and she was she introduced me to the word white saviorism which I'd never heard before and anyway she really articulated every single thing that was problematic about what we did through her lens as a brown woman. And I had just never looked at it through that lens before. And I was like, it was like my heart dropped out of my body. And I knew on such a deep level that not only did we mess up and not only did we do harm to her and her friends um, her friends and, you know, other people that came to that event and obviously noticed the same issues um, I just realized not only did I do that, but also like the depth of my lack of awareness was just like so profound and I wanted to fix it all. And now I see, like, I see when other people get called out for their racism, like I see it's, they're all often very reactive and they like post all these things and they're like trying to show how they're doing good. Like I, but really it's just like not something that you can fix uh, in a day. So that was September, 2019. And since then, like it really opened my eyes to um, other, like, you know, things in the industry that are happening, like 
like just that, you know, people who are not white don't have the same opportunity. And often the way in the industry, like so many, like even let's take our conversation about risk. We are so fortunate in our privilege that we have the safety net. Whereas someone who does not, someone who does not have the same level of access that we do, someone that will not just be like when I was a copywriter charging $5,000 a day, nobody asked me about my credentials. Nobody asked me like about my experience. Nobody even asked me to see samples. Like that is, that is my privilege as a white person, as someone who's like, I have white privilege. I have thin privilege. I have the privilege of beauty. Like I have so many layers of privilege. This isn't just about race. Um, so anyway, in the industry, I just see how people are um, like we sort of presume there's all these leaders like me who are white and who hold enormous privilege and who sort of think that everybody has that same access, that anybody can just say like, hey, I'm an expert and everybody just lines up to buy from them or even like, you know, certain business investments like, well, I could if I made a three thousand dollar investment and it turned out to be a wash like even in my first year in business, I would have been fine. I have a network. I have support. Like, so for me, like a lot of my unlearning has just been like going back to that email that I got and my, my student Syra, who became a mentor to me, um, just like learning to see things through someone else's eyes. Who's not like me, who's a different size, who's a different religion, who's a different, uh, you know, different race, different, whatever I'm different gender, even like I'm, I realized like, Oh, it's like all of my marketing. And I still do this sometimes. Like I presume that the people I'm talking to are exactly like me and they are not like, so that's something I've been unpacking all year and really trying to lead, um, lead my people in a new direction because that is still a major problem in the online course industry. It's like, it's rampant and people are waking up and I see them trying to figure it out and take responsibility. And some people are just not, some people are just like, no, this, I, I don't have to look at this. And um, we're all on our own journey. So I've made so many mistakes. Like I don't judge anyone. I just try and figure it out for myself and do better. Yeah, no. And I think that your ability or your willingness, not even ability, your willingness to take it on and to be vocal about it and to admit where you've, you know, made mistakes and made failures, it kind of ties really beautifully back into what we even began with, which is, you know, your biggest failures are become your best stories. They become your biggest learning. But we always say in the business, you either um, succeed or you learn. You know, it's of yes. course failure. You do fail and failure is wonderful. I always say to everyone in the business who works for me, I'm like, you have failure is fantastic. It's how we learn. If you don't admit where you failed, totally. we don't know where we have a missing resource and we can't fix the problem. Mm -hmm. You know, bring all your failures to us so that we can figure shit out. Like there's no punishment. There's no blame. You were limited, you know, unless you purposely did something bad, which very few people do. It was a mistake. It, it, it yeah. shows an area where we need a, a, where we have a missing resource and where we can grow. And I always say to the people who work for me, you will actually stunt the business growth if you don't bring your failures to me and my, my highest value is growing and you will hold me back from that, which is worse for me than your failure. So understand totally. if you choose to hide your failure, you're actually working against what we're trying to achieve. Whereas admitting your failure is working for what we're trying to achieve. And so that has really reframed a lot of, a lot of the people who work for me, who we've had this experience together. They've said, you know, like that really reframed it for them, realizing mm -hmm. that actually by not admitting their failure, they were, you know, holding the business back. So I love that you were so willing to, to take it on and to, and like, as you said, it is a very personal, um, it is a very personal journey and everybody has their own journey. And, mm -hmm. um, and I love that it's, you know, the world is becoming more aware. And I think, I think a lot of it is very cultural as well, as well. Like I do talk about this sometimes in the podcast and it's, and it's not me trying to be insensitive or, or whatever, but I think that culturally, depending on where you live in the world, it is more prevalent. Like over here in Belfast, it's all about Protestants and Catholics. So, oh, yeah. you know, I could, you know, and, and I have a friend who applied for the police service recently and she didn't 
get in. And she was like, I cannot believe it. Like I know other people who got in who are, you know, far less qualified than me and, and whatever. And it's because they're trying to increase the ratio of Catholics to Protestants because the Catholics mm -hmm. were in here in Northern Ireland were the ones who were always persecuted and, you know, weren't given equal rights and were looked down upon. And so it was the Protestants had the privilege. So it was Protestant privilege here in Belfast. It's not white privilege, it's Protestant privilege. Uh, we don't really, so interesting. there's not and even really people of color in Ireland, uh, truly in Belfast. I can go, Tarzan, I can go six months without seeing one person who does not have white skin. Six I months. also live in a super white town. Like there's no, there are, um, mostly white people, mm -hmm. mostly white people. So that's like, that's my lens. And that's who I just assume I'm talking to all day. So I just talk to people like that, but you know, my audience, like they're all over the world. They yeah, have like too. all sorts of complex dynamics going on. And I think more like it's, there is no getting it right. No, nobody knows. Like there's no getting it right. There's no, I might get it like, it, you know, I send emails about this from time to time and I, it's always hard because like half the replies are like, Oh, Tarzan, thank you. Like, you're so great. Thanks for bringing this up. I love those emails, but mm -hmm. then there might be an equal number of people that are like, no, this is not my experience. You are wrong about this. You're wrong about this. You're wrong about this. I read those and I learn from them. Um, but I think we just have to let go of getting it right. Like, actually, I think what I can model the most is not like, here's how to do it. Here's how to do social justice. Like, no, there is no one way. I'm just showing up to say, like, I'm invested in this. Mm -hmm. I am taking the time to learn. I am trying to do better. Like, what more can you do than that? No, you're right. Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. And and it's exactly the same as what I was talking about a minute ago with the business, even if you want to take it into a different context, because I know that I've struggled with the whole, oh my, I'm like, oh my God, am I allowed to say, to, is it person of color? Am I allowed to say black? Am I allowed to, I'm brown? What, you know, what, like, I know that I, it's all these terms that I don't even, you know, and I haven't, I haven't actually taken the time to be honest. Um, I hardly have time to go to the bathroom these days. So I'm going to make that excuse of, I really just haven't taken the time to focus on it. But I think that it, it comes down to, you know, the same thing I always say to people who work for me, you're trying your best. As long as you're trying your best, you're always going to be failing. But as long as you try to put that failure right and you don't, you know, and you don't like bury your head in the sand and pretend that it didn't happen and that it's not happening and that you didn't affect someone or something bad didn't happen as a result of your action, well, then you can fix it. It's the, it's always a person's intent that it comes down to. And I think yeah, that is. And, and actually there's like, this is another reason why I talk about it so much because there's been a pattern in the industry of people not taking responsibility. Like, you know, I heard so many times last summer um, you know, as this, there was this resurgence, this beautiful resurgence of Black Lives Matter. Like so many times I heard people saying as, you know, as so such and such an influencer is like, um, I'm going to do better. And I'm like, I'm woke now. Look at me. Someone else would say like, I approached you about this and you did nothing. Uh, my friends have approached you about this and you did nothing. Like so much of it, and this is where I got started is like just acknowledging like, oh my God, I fucked up so large and mm -hmm. I promise I'm going to figure this out and do better. Like yeah. that's- People are so prideful people. though. It's so hard. Pride is like, it's one of the seven deadly sins, yes. you know? We're so invested in our vision of ourselves and what other people think of our, think of us, you know? And we're, um, you know, it's, it, pride is one of the, it's one of the worst- worst traits that we can have in terms of like, honestly pride in your work and pride in your appearance and that kind of stuff is good but whenever pride as a confusion as in like I am my results or I am my image of myself or I am something which isn't human inherently human I think that that's when the whole thing becomes you know confused and dangerous quite frankly you know it's um it's one of the major problems with the world, which we could get into on a whole other podcast, but we're kind of just right out of time. <laughs> um, Tarzan, this has been like truly spectacular. And I really, really wanted to talk more about your copywriting course because it is what my, um, my, my, my people in my million dollar mentor group are always recommending it to each other. So just so people know where they can go and find out more about that, tell us where they can connect with you, where they can find you, where they can talk to you <laughs> about social issues or business issues or, cause you're an open book, aren't you? You're like, you're happy to chat I, with people. 
I am, there are certain topics I don't talk about, but the important stuff, I talk about it all. And um, so the most important place to find me is on my emails. I write the best emails. Kim can attest. I can confirm. They are story-based. They're funny. They're everything that you want in an email. So join my email list on my website, tarzank.com or go to tarzank.com slash email. If you want a swipe file of really great sales emails, I also hang out on Instagram. That's my primary social platform. So I'm, I'm in my DMS. If you want to talk to me, um, but get on the email list. The copywriting course is called copy caboose. It launches on March 24th. And, um, that's what I'm working on right now. It's in development. So you can talk to me if you want, if you want to talk about what you have in it, what you want in it. But, um, in copy caboose, we go through the fundamentals of copywriting, like writing headlines, writing bullet points, writing your homepage, writing landing pages. And we go through specific lessons and we also talk about writing inclusively. So we all write through our own lens. Uh, and there's a whole module on how you can make sure you are writing for different types, people who are different than you. And that's not just good practice socially. That's also good for business. So all of the stuff we have talked about on this podcast is basically built into Copy Caboose. Um, so look for that in March. Oh, I love that. I absolutely love it. Thank you. And definitely let me know when that launches so I can shout it out to my people as well and pick up a copy for um, uh, for one of our content writers who is studying copywriting within uh, The Sculpted Vegan. So definitely my go-to resource. Uh, Tarzan, this was absolutely phenomenal. Thank you so much. I'm so glad that it actually worked this time for <laughs> us. But you know, last time was just a practice run. And, uh, just for those totally. who are like, was she on here before? Where is it? No, it never got published because we had microphone issues and recording issues and yeah but this one is perfect so we made it what can we say um Thanks, tarzan, thank you so much guys um if you want to find out all everything tarzan talked about is in the show notes um as well as links to her website and her instagram and all the stuff she talked about so definitely go there and um if you want to find out more about what she does the world's most expensive former copywriter <laughs> and uh tarzan thank you so much i'll talk to you soon oh I was that wasn't it just amazing I love Tarzan so much I really do um she truly has become one of my favorite most favorite human beings um you know when you meet someone and you just click with them like you just have that instant connection where you feel like you are sisters from another mother like soul sisters you must have known each other in another life and that's how I felt about Tarzan she and I just understood each other the minute we met we just were on another level from the very first conversation that we had and I just truly think she is a phenomenal human being um, and I hope that you loved her as much as I did so I hope that you will go and check her out on Instagram her stories are really funny definitely sign up to her mailing list because she writes some good shit let me tell you like I love her email they're highly entertaining so definitely go sign up for her mailing list and um, follow her on instagram and just reach out to her and like send her a dm and say hi if you want to because she really is so open to you know connecting with her followers and uh like i said she's just an all-round really good human being she's one of the good ones one of the good ones you can trust in tarzan actually that should be a slogan shouldn't it trust in tarzan <laughs> Um, okay, guys, so listen, I hope you enjoyed this episode of the podcast. I will see you next week for um, another podcast episode, the interview with JP Sears. It is not one to be missed. He is going to be highly controversial. He's going to say a lot of shit that he shouldn't be saying, but he's also just going to be a fabulous, wonderful human being. So look out for that next week. Hope you have a wonderful rest of the week wherever you are in the world. Thank you so much for listening. And I will talk to you next week on the Kim Constable podcast. Bye for now.